population and consumption. And I, I'd like to start with, um, and, and what happened in the last, or what the discussion was in the last conversation about forests and impacts on forests extends beyond uh, that locality. Because a lot of those products, a lot of those pressures from around the world are for the rest of us. And I want to give you some statistics just to set the stage here. And before I do that, also, there, is, uh, there are two groups of thought around these two subjects. One is, is that population is the number one issue that we have to address if we're going to be sustainable. There's another theory that overconsumption is the number one issue. So keep that in mind as we go through this, uh, through this panel. So the world's richest 7% are responsible for 50% of all the CO2. The ecological footprint of an American for how much food, how much land area you need for food, water, clothing, the essentials for one American is 9.5 hectares. For someone in Africa, it is way under a hectare. The uh, uh, governments is, is a real issue, and, and as we heard in this last panel, if governments don't get engaged in the consumption and the sustainability level of what's happening in their countries, particularly the rich countries, one American's emissions equals four Chinese, 20 people from India, 250 Ethiopians. And the intergenerational legacy in America, and I'm choosing America because we're the number one. <coughs> we really are the number one consumers. The intergenerational legacy is, um, I just read a study the other day, is that down the line, a child born today in America will have seven times the carbon footprint that American ha uh, an American has right now. So obviously, this gets into a lot of different perspectives on what we're doing. Trillions of dollars between 1900, there was about $1.2 trillion that was spent on consumer products. In 1998, it was 24 trillion, and since then, it's almost doubled. So with that, I'm going to start with Lester, because I asked Lester to give us the profile of population and then how that relates to consumption. Um, what I thought I would do is use the food economy to um, compare population growth and rising affluence. It's a, sort of a simple model, but it, it gives us a sense. Um, the world's population is growing by 80 billion a year. Um, that means there will be 216,000 people at the dinner table tonight who were not there last night. So it's a very substantial, it's a couple of stadium, you know, large stadiums full of people we're adding each day. And we've been doing it for not just years, but decades now. So it, it, it begins to put pressure on resources, whether it's water resources or, or forests, as we were discussing uh, earlier, um, land resources. Um, the, the, the growth of population, the 1.1% or so a year, is the, the uh, 80 million. But we also have rising affluence. To compare the average person in India with the average person in the United States, I would use the grain requirements ladder. Um, this measures the, the impact of, or the, the growing demand for animal protein. The, the average person in India consumes about 400 pounds of grain per year. It's about a pound a day. In this country, we consume about 1,600 pounds of grain per year per person, four times as much. 
Of that 1,600 pounds, we consume maybe 150 pounds directly as bread, pastries, breakfast cereal. The great bulk of that we consume indirectly in the form of animal protein. I mean, the rule of thumb is that uh, to get another pound of live weight on the steer in the feedlot takes about seven pounds of grain. Uh, to get another pound of uh, growth in a, in a pig takes about three pounds of grain. Chickens closer to two pounds of grain per pound of, of um, live weight. So they're, depending on which meats we consume, um, uh, sorry, which meat we choose to consume very much influences where we are on the grain uh, requirements ladder. In looking at the growth in world demand, 80 million people a year translates into about 24 million tons of grain per year against a global harvest of 2.4 billion tons of grain. Um, we were running into constraints on efforts to expand the grain harvest fast enough to keep up with population growth and rising affluence at the same time. Population growth by itself, just over 1%. When you include rising affluence, then it becomes about 2%. In the last few years, for the first time in world history, we have seen a situation where the, the annual growth in demand for grain um, to feed cattle, poultry, has actually been somewhat larger than the growth in world demand for grain from population growth. So this is kind of a historical shift that we've, we've uh, occurred. They're, they're, um, they're, they're very close. Um, the reason all this is a problem is because we don't have unlimited resources to produce food. We're producing, we're using almost all the land in the world today that should be used for agriculture. And that, that doesn't include clearing the Amazon rainforest because I don't think that land should be used for agriculture. So we're pretty much against the limits on land. And then with water, uh, we're, we're really in trouble. I think water is emerging as the principal constraint on efforts to expand world food production. Um, I mean, we drink four liters of water a day, but the food we consume each day takes about 2,000 liters of water to produce or 500 times as much. Stated simply, we eat 500 times as much water as we drink. So how much we drink is trivial. I mean, it gets lost in the rounding. It's how much is embodied in the, in the grain that we consume, which is really the, and, and, and the meat, which is really the, the big uh, factor. So we have land not expanding anymore. We have over pumping of water in many places in the world. We, someone referred to Texas and Oklahoma and the Ogallala Aquifer, that's one place. But that's, that, that's actually pretty small for us. We don't have much irrigated grain production in the United States. Most of our grain is produced in the Corn Belt. And just to give you a, a sense of how important that agricultural real estate is, the state of Iowa produces more grain than Canada and more soybeans than China at the same time. This is, this is high value real estate, very, very productive. Um, so we, but, but as, as a general matter, uh, land and water are emerging as constraints. We're over pumping uh, in China, under the North China Plain. In India, where farmers have invested, you don't have, you don't have to have a license to dig, in, to dig an irrigation well in India. And as a result, India now has 26 million irrigation wells. Um, and water tables are falling in every state in India. This is serious overpumping, but no one's in charge. You don't, you don't have to have a license, so anyone who wants to can, can drill an irrigation well. But at some point, you, you get into difficulty. The World Bank, some years ago, estimated that 175 million people in India are being fed with grain produced by overpumping water. You can overpump in the short run, but by definition, not in the long run. And, and that's where we're seeing some dramatic adjustments. Probably the most dramatic in the world would be the Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria, Iraq. Those four countries have all overpumped their aquifers. They've all experienced peak water, and they have also each experienced peak grain. In that, that's, this is the first area in the world, first region, uh, where we have seen 
grain production decline in absolute terms and, and fairly rapidly as a result of aquifer depletion. There will be more, but this is the first one where peak water has translated into peak grain. We've been looking at rising, oh, let, let me mention one other thing. One is climate change. It's very difficult. We, we know what the effects of water shortages are. Climate change is very difficult uh, to assess. We know that a one degree rise in temperature, one degree Celsius rise, reduces grain yield 17%. One degree Celsius rise in temperature reduces grain yield 17%. The projected rise in temperature this century is up to six degrees Celsius. Try to run that arithmetic through. If one degree Celsius rise drops yields 17%, imagine the sort of problem we're going to face if, if we stay on the, on, on the current um, uh, path in terms of, of increasing uh, carbon emissions. So climate's a big issue. Um, back when I was farming in the 1950s, uh, we had fluctuations in weather. We might have a drought one year, which would reduce the tomato crop. But we didn't worry too much, because next year, things would probably go back to normal. Today, there is no norm to go back to. The whole climate system is in flux. And, and farmers can't anticipate it. This is a very difficult time to be a farmer because you just don't know what's going to be happening and how fast and, and, and when. Um, one of the consequences of these constraints that make it more difficult to expand production is that world food prices have doubled over the last decade or so. Now, it doesn't really bother us very much if, if world grain prices double. Um, we buy a loaf of bread for $3. It has in it maybe 15 cents worth of wheat. The price of wheat doubles. The loaf of bread goes to $3.15. I mean, it, we just don't, we're, we're so isolated with all the processing and marketing and, and so forth in between. But if you live in New Delhi and you go to the market each day and buy wheat and bring it home and grind it into flours and make chapatis, if the world price of wheat doubles, the price of your chapatis double. That's the difference between us and most of the low-income people in the world. We really don't feel it very much. They do. Um, and one of the consequences um, of this, and this is my, my final point, is that we have, during the half century or so I've been working on and tracking world agricultural trends, we've, we've seen the emergence of a one meal a day sort of thing in low-income uh, segments of low-income societies. Now we're seeing something beyond that. In a number of countries, Nigeria, for example, 22% of all families now plan foodless days. It's not, are we going to eat once a day? But some days they will not eat. So on a Sunday night, the family gets together. The same thing is true for Ethiopia, India, uh, Bangladesh, for example, uh, um, uh, Peru. Um, a large percentage of families, usually around 20, uh, 24%, now plan foodless days. They know they can't afford to eat every day. So on Sunday night, the family gets together and said, well, we should be able to eat five days this week, so we'll skip Wednesday and Saturday. This is new. We've not had this before, where people realize they simply cannot eat every day, and it becomes part of their lifestyle. Um, it's been so recent that we, we, we don't really have much research on the consequences of what this means, particularly for young people and, and their physical and mental development. But it, it is one of the most, I think, one of the most serious issues um, that we face today, but it's not yet been recognized as such. Thank you. Thank you, Lester. That sort of sets the, the, the ground floor here because food and water are the real two essentials. I'm going to go to Marilyn next, and I'm going to put her a little bit on the hot spot. Um, she was CEO of, as I said, of Aveda. She's also been on the board of Nike and Reebok as well. Nike is one of the seven companies that have been targeted as not to buy from, because not because of their human rights, uh, protocols and how far you've come in that direction, 
but because, and Coca-Cola is another one, um, but because of overconsumption, excessive consumption of various products is creating the situation that you're talking about, along with population, but as far as changes in temperature and changes in water are coming from carbon emissions. So I would like you to tell us a little bit about what you were on the inside of these companies. Um, Avade is a little bit more conscious, I would think, than Nike. But if you can just tell us a little bit from the consumption side of this conversation. Thank you. I'm <laughs> it's a great way to start by saying, OK, I've been in a hot seat. That's great. Um, <laughs> because I have good answers. And, and that's when it's a relief to feel that. I'm, when I was at Nike, I was at Nike um, a little less than two years. Philosophically, we had a lot of differences, but I won't go into those now. And um, subsequent to that, I had my own company, and then I went to Reebok. The thing that I did at Reebok, which I could not get enacted in Nike, is what Sally is talking about. In Reebok, we were able to really go back to um, something I'll show you in a little while on, on some slides I have. Um, from my own personal experience of understanding what Lester was talking about, the whole consumption cycle, because I come from Hong Kong. I come from understanding and seeing what it was like to have nothing or very little. And then how does a person like that come to running a major international corporation responsible for a lot of the consumption that is taking place, including, as Sally says, where they're using excessive resources. And what I, we were able to do at Reebok was to go back through the whole supply chain down to where we, where we buy the initial raw materials. So it's a matter of reviewing the whole supply chain, not just saying, um, are, are we making this most efficiently? Are we choosing the right whatever? But right down to, as we did also in Nevada, right down to the raw materials and saying, how is this produced? And, and then, how is it being manufactured? And so part of the reason Nike got into this situation they did is because Reebok showed them as an example of how it could be done and still be relatively successful. So I guess that is a way of saying <laughs> it's not my fault, but, but truthfully, it, it, it's bigger than that. It's really about understanding that it's all our fault because we are part of the consumerism that is happening right now. So um, in some of my slides, I'll share with you is, um, if this works. Could somebody put up my slides, please? Ah, something's up. The, this first picture is um, of Tai Po Harbor in, in Kowloon, Hong Kong, when I was a child in the 60s. And these are fisher people, mostly Hakka. And they lived on their boats. They ate on their boats. They fished from their boats. And the children took care of each other. And of course, they also threw everything that was excess into the ocean. So it's not a completely good system. But they were very low impact as far as into the environment. And um, I, I was in that area for several years, living in the area. So I really got a direct perspective on how people lived in a different way. Also in the same area were a lot of fabric and garment factories. And at the end of the processing of whatever it was they were processing, the water with the dye stuff or the whatever that we were doing, stone washing or garment washing, all that just went directly into the river and into the ocean. So it's not a perfect system. But it gave me an understanding of what happened. Now, several years later, maybe 15 years later in the 80s, Hong Kong became much more affluent. And those areas, this is the same area. It doesn't even look like, because so much of the land was refilled with, they call it reclaimed land, which means they just bulldozed the mountain and fell in the ocean. Um, those people that were the fisher people were displaced, obviously, and they moved into these areas. If you want to talk about per capita consumption, of course it went up, the children went to school, they were more into the whole system, but 
garment manufacturing and all that still went on. And this is where I was now working and dealing with this. It went into places like China, where the dye stuff still went into the river. It went into places like Bangladesh, where they had small operation where they died and the children were working on this. So the situation didn't get better, it just got moved. And this is what I think Leslie was talking about too. It just, the affluence goes up, but our demands are still going up, and so it just moves the whole production cycle to other places where we are polluting. And it's us that's polluting it, because it's our consumption that's demanding all this. So the question is, how do we as leaders in the developed world determine what we produce and if they are sustainable? And that's really the question that we as manufacturers have to think about, but you as consumers also have to think about. And then what is the responsible way for us to market our products? Because if there's no demand, there's nothing to be made. It's ultimately us as consumers, but also it's responsible for the marketers, be it Reebok, Aveda, Nike, how they tell you what it is that you need. And are you listening? So the idea, that the first one is to go back to the source of raw material. And I'm using Aveda where we went back to the Amazon, to Brazil, and to there where we worked with the indigenous people to go back to growing indigenous plants so that we can have what we in the Western world want, which is color cosmetics, hair color, et cetera, but from plants and organically. It's not easy because these people have been dis displaced twice. Once when rubber tapping came in, when rubber growing, and then that it, synthetics became much more important, so that became, they got displaced from that again. And then more land got clear, clear cut for cattle growing, for our hamburgers. So going back and working with these people to reclaim some identity, to grow back the indigenous plants. Takes education, takes patience, takes money, and takes fortitude for, the, for, for us as manufacturers. And you can support that whole process if you get educated in who is doing this kind of work. Because ultimately, it's not just for them, it's for us. You also want organic and healthy products to put in your body and to, and, and to ingest in your, inside your body. So it's a win-win for everybody. Another one is to review the whole supply chain. Sustainability. We talk about organic being the, the, the gold standard. I want to question that. Organic is not maybe the gold standard. Maybe you don't need it at all. Maybe you don't need to have that second or third or fourth, whatever it is you're buying. Maybe you don't, and if you do, what other options are there? That Because cotton is a very thirsty plant. It demands a lot of water. We grow a lot in California. We grow a lot in a lot of parts of the world where it's less as saying, we are having water problems. Do we need cotton, even if it's organic? Can we use another fabric? Can we use hemp? Can we use recycled wool? Can we use a lot of other, synth uh, even synth synthetics? I've been working with some um, manufacturers on recycled petrochemicals, water bottles to be made into clothing, yogurt cups. These are ways of us to look at the whole supply chain to reduce our footprint. So these are the things for us to think about. Is it maybe organic may not be the gold standard. Maybe we don't need it at all, and if we do, what other options do we have? What is the source of material? It might not be cotton, it might not be that. Another issue for manufacturers, as well as for us, is packaging. And a lot of times now in California, where I live, a lot of places are enacting the fact that you cannot get a bag from the grocery store. You have to bring your own bag. You may think it's a small thing. My little store um, in my neighborhood, I asked them, since they, this law just came into effect this year, I said, how many bags have you saved? They said, oh, I think we're saving about a million and a half bags in my little store because people now bring it in. If you get one a bag from, from the store, they will sell you a paper bag for 10 cents. For 10 cents, it changed behavior. Can we do that without charging ourselves 10 cents? This is the sort of thing we can think about. And shipping and packing, where do your goods come from? Is it better to buy local and organic? Or is it better to buy uh, local and inorganic? Or is it better to buy something from Peru 
or New, Ze New Zealand, the shipping, the footprint of that final product you're buying makes a big difference. We can be aware of that as well as the manufacturers can be aware of that. How can we be more direct, reducing the lo level and the number? As a manufacturer, we think about that, but as consumers, let's think about that too. Consumerism is more really more, and that's something we have to think about. Mm. What, what do we really need? And I, this is a term that I read, I read about and thought that was very interesting, hedonic adaptation. First, we need one whatever it is a day. And then we think, well, that's not good enough. I need two. And then we need the one that's better. And then pretty soon we're placing things just because we've been conditioned to think that new or bigger is better. We adapt to it. And, but the le level of satisfaction, and I'm going to talk about something that I talked about the other day, is inner peace and happiness. That comes from inside. By the more stuff we get, it doesn't make us unhappier. It's temporary, that happiness. That true happiness has to come back from inside. And that way, we're really going to reduce consumerism. So I'm going to show a picture. This is in Bhutan. I said it was 2006. Uh, that's actually wrong. It's 2004. At that time, it was probably less than $600 a year. It's probably $400 a year per capita uh, GDP. If you see on the far corner, there's a Coca-Cola and a Fanta sign. The Coca-Cola and Fanta went to that area and talked these people into putting up these signs because they would pay for the rest of the sign that says the store's name. Stores never had names before because they never had, everybody knew anybody. But now, now this came in and there's a whole level of demand for products that's really not necessary. Now we think, what do you really need? You only need water. I'm so sorry to you, but you know, all we really need to drink is water. But now we think we need soft drinks. We need whatever it is that we need, drinking-wise. And truthfully, the body is only asking for water. So I just want to sh show this as what's happening with marketing. This is, mar this is Coca-Cola's motto in marketing, an arm's reach of desire. In other words, there has to be a Coke for every person when they want get thirsty that they can buy within arm's reach. Think about this as a marketing concept that we are, as manufacturers, perpetuating. It's up to you to think about, do you want to buy into that? And you have the vote. You are the ones who decide what gets made because you have the dollars. So I would say the first thing is reduce your consumption, reuse what you have, and then the third is recycle. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A couple, couple points that I would like <clears throat> to pick up on. Um, advertising. Advertising has, you know, we have 450 shampoos in the supermarket, in the drugstore. Do we really need that? The answer is no, we don't. I have a little place in Argentina where I live off the grid, live on horseback, have a, two little solar panels. We live on horseback on the property. If you go to see your neighbor, you get on your horse. And you don't use any of this stuff, and guess what? You don't need it. You really don't need it. The other point I want to make is sustainability um, labeling, which is something that's come up in uh, political discussions, is, is would people change their behavior if there was sustainability labeling on where did all the ingredients come from in a product? The answer is probably yes. That's, that's one way. People, people don't want to use palm oil that's in Oreos and Girl Scout cookies at the expense of Indonesian forests and their orangutan. If they know, they say, oh my god, I don't want to do that. You know, so, so to get on the radical side of that, boycotting is one of it. The more demand through the advertising, through the promotion of these products, the more production. The more production, the more extraction. So it really is about saying no. Like all the clothes I have on right now are from consignment. Every, every, all, almost all my clothes are on consignment. I, I get on consignment. 
most of the furniture in my house is on consignment or really, really old. So we don't have to buy new. We really don't have, there is enough in this world that we can recycle, 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 recycle. Uh, the other point that I want to make is, uh, and I'm just going to share some really quick figures here because I want to get into ethical consumption and uh, Marcy and Eric. Um, but there's luxury versus necessity. And in America, we are really luxury driven. So, so and, and values. This gets into what are our real values, which they touched on in the last panel. We spend, this is globally, we spend almost $18 billion on makeup. Reproductive health care for all women would be 12 billion. Pet food, 17 billion. Elimination of hunger and malnutrition, about the same. Perfume, 15 billion. Universal literacy, we spend a little under 5 billion. Ocean cruises, 15 billion dollars. Clean drinking water for all, under 10. Ice cream in Europe, 12 billion. Immunizing every child, less than 1 billion. And then you could do, you could also look at this in relationship to what is the bequest value of forests and rivers? What is the intergenerational value? And there are some economists that are looking at that, and it far out, outstrips what, it, what the value is of a tree taken at this moment in time to make a reproduction out of mahogany of an antique so somebody can buy it in North Carolina. So those are the kinds of things. So now, ethical consumption. And what is that? And what does that look like? You have been a pioneer in eco-fashion and sourcing at an organic level and promoting this, and you've been very successful. Please tell us about your work. Okay, so I can, I have a couple of slides um, that I like to speak visually. Of course, I'm in the fashion business. That's just sort of inherent in what I do. Um, but I'm not gonna go too deep on some of the topics. I'm just gonna um, give you just a, a sound bite or a taste of why I have committed my life uh, to and my passion to revolutionizing the fashion industry. Um, first of all, I'm a dot connector and I came out of the organic and natural food industry. And 60% uh, of a cotton plant, as an example, ends up in our food system. So when I started to learn about the interconnection between food and fiber, and I started to look at the magnitude and multitude of impacts in the fiber world and in the fashion and textile worlds, uh, it became unbelievably uh, overwhelming to me that this was an industry that we could not ignore any, any longer. Um, it started for me in cotton, coming out of you know, food, and when I learned that less than 3% of the world's agriculture is cotton, but 25% of the most harmful insecticides up to 10% of the most toxic carcinogenic pesticides uh, are used on the cotton industry, it became clear that you know, we had to look at a new paradigm for cotton. So in an ideal world, we could say no longer consume cotton, but between bedding and bath and clothing, that's uh, not very likely. So it's now about shifting the paradigm of cotton and looking at you know, how do we address something that's one of the leading causes of air and water pollution, which most people think cotton is a natural fiber. They have no idea that when you pull the curtain back on the cotton industry, you actually not only do you have all the chemicals uh, but you also have uh, added formaldehyde and added chlorine bleaches and, and heavy metals in the processing of cotton. So when you look at, when you listen to some of the earlier panels about a more sustainable solution, and one that actually is a solution to climate change, that would be organic cotton, certified organic cotton. And then we have all the other impacts, and the one I want to hone in on, of course, is that the global textile industry actually uses about 10% of the world's carbon impact. So over a trillion kilowatt hours a year are coming out of the global textile industry um, for production, dyeing, finishing, and it is, um, you know, when you look at water, when you look at waste, um, of course, chemical use, 
social standards as well as um, energy and, and carbon footprint, we have to create a new fashion industry. So we started with Whole Foods with my company just to connect those dots and to show that you don't have to give up style, quality, color, fit, comfort. We launched the first organic cotton program for Target, even price. So my mantra has always been break every stigma of organic and sustainable fashion. It's not about this or that. It's about this and that. So when we look at positive consumerism, we have to look at good business and good products, better products, ethical products. We have to shop with our dollars. We have to vote or vote with our dollars as consumers. And we have to no longer support the companies that are depleting and destroying, but those that are actually building a better tomorrow. And even the hotel and spa industry, I and mean, everyone here travels, you know, you can see the impact on textiles uh, in that industry. And so using organic cotton over conventional cotton can make a significant difference. We also are um, very big on collaboration and uh, education and inspiration and innovation. And these are all ways that we can shift the paradigm. So educating the media about why organic and sustainable and ethical fashion matters is hugely important. And a lot of people, everyone in this room and everyone on this planet relates to textiles. Yet very few people actually stop to think about the impact that those textiles are having on human health, on the planet, on future generations. So we have to think differently. You know, every product matters. And, you know, there is no compromise. I mean, that's the winning formula here is that, you know, you don't have to give up anything, you get more. So when you talk about, Sally mentioned value, it's value values is the new model for business. It's about win-win. It's about one plus one equals 11. And one of the reasons I'm here today is we have to connect these dots because the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And all of us are out there trying to create a better world and um, a more sustainable planet and, and humanity and protect humanity. And that is, um, when you look at the textile industry as you know, one of the worst next to coal, um, we all can play a role in making it a difference there. So um, whether we're leveraging celebrities to get the word out, and everyone knows fashion and textiles are often uh, who's wearing it and what are they wearing, or uh, collaborating and co-creating with thought leaders and other educators so we can tell our stories together. And then looking at how we can align with all of the NGOs out there that are starting to shift this paradigm in fashion. One of the really encouraging things for me, and I'm very optimistic, is looking at the next generation. I have two teenagers, and these kids are growing up where you know, natural foods, whole foods, organic foods are in their supermarkets, in their cities, yoga's in their gym. They're growing up more consciously. And when I used to say the concept of e eco-fashion years ago, people looked at me like I was crazy. You know, such a, a paradoxical uh, word, really. And the fact that, you know, these, those two worlds used to be very dichotomous. You know, if you're humanitarian and ecologically minded, that, that wouldn't uh, fit with people who are looking at fashion as very material and all about the surface. But today, that next generation, when you say eco-fashion, there's an instant get. And I've seen the fashion industry, uh, as well as the fashion in institutes in this country, go from you know, this kind of really small niche concept to entire tracks dedicated to social innovation, to sustainable fashion. And, um, and I see it because a lot of these designers, emerging designers, they want to incorporate and they want to uh, have sustainability embedded in their design. And looking at innovation, I mean, the, the Hig Index, this is um, also collaboration. There is an organization called the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which represents about 85% of the world's apparel manufacturers right now that are all coming together to join forces and look at how can we measure those impacts in the supply chain. You know, as Marilyn spoke to, we have to look at the raw materials we're using. We have to ask the question about, you know, how much energy are we using, how much water, Who's making our clothes? Where are they being made? Whether it's Cradle to Cradle that's launching their fashion positive project right now um, to Fair Trade USA, or Eucalyptus, which is a solution to cotton. Eucalyptus is actually grown without water, and it's manufactured in a closed loop system, and all the byproducts are used efficiently. So whether it's Recycle Poly, or it's some of these innovative fibers that are out there right now, there are many solutions, and, and uh, many more coming. And then when you look at Bangladesh and what happened um, in April of 2013, of course, you know, 1,133 people lost their lives in a single day. 
um, because of the working conditions in the fashion industry, lack thereof, I should say. But one of the encouraging things in terms of you know, consumer motivation is that uh, this year, on April uh, 24th, 2014, 58 countries around the world came together to uh, start what's called Fashion Revolution Day that is honoring these victims. And now, and I'll just you know, end by saying that this is a, is a sign of what's to come in terms of consumer engagement. Fashion, as it was, is not sustainable. There is an, we have to create a new fashion industry and engage people to collaborate all over the world uh, to shift the paradigm. And these are all kinds of websites now where you can buy sustainable and eco fashion. There's more being born uh, constantly, and together we can uh, create a new reality in fashion. So that's my quickie. Thank you. Thank you. Which I represent the beverage business, beverage industry in the world. Um, and we are probably one of the greatest over-consumers uh, here, certainly in America. There's no reason people need to drink 100 million bottles of soda a day. There's no reason people need to drink 100 million bottles of beer on Friday night. There's no reason. It's actually insanity. I mean, listening to all the, the, stat the statistics and the data and, and, and the topics that are brought up here in this panel, it almost just seems insane that the world allows us to go on. It's, it's really just insanity. And we see in the beverage business, it's only going to change not from the people at Coca-Cola or at Pepsi or the larger companies that are afraid to stand up and make these decisions. It's going to change from the consumer demanding it, and then the retailers also supporting that demand. So I, I just briefly, how I got into this was from author, uh, an authentic upbringing. I was raised in an uh, organic vegetarian kind of hippie household in the 70s. We had an organic vegetable garden, so I uh, learned as a very young kid that uh, pesticides and herbicides aren't good for your body. Our vegetables tasted great. We were vegetarian. We didn't eat meat. We didn't believe in factory farming. Uh, we were raised in a renewable energy type um, eco-friendly household. Thanks to Jimmy Carter, when I was nine years old, my dad put three solar panels on the roof. Our neighbors were actually complaining. They called the police on us. But the next month, he showed the whole neighborhood how we saved 30% on our electricity. And everyone said, well, we should do that too. How do we do it? And so as a very young kid, these were uh, kind of belief systems instilled in me, and I said, someday I'm going to be in the business that makes a, a change in the world. So getting into the beverage business, and just, again, real brief, the science is over. But I, I figured I could take on the Coke, the Pepsis, and the big companies in the world and show them that a little company could care and maybe be that difference that they someday should be themselves. So when we started Steez, we were the first organic USDA-certified soda company in America. We went on to have great success our first few years because of that. And the next thing we had to do is become a fair trade uh, a certified company. So we actually did care about the farmers and care about the people and care about the land where our products and crops are grown throughout the world. The next big initiative, which was really the passion that goes back to Jimmy Carter and what he did, um, was we worked with uh, Native Energy in 2007 um, to be the very first beverage company in America to offset all of its carbon emissions. And that was a really important thing for the beverage business because people thought, people thought that was nuts too. And I had people at Coca-Cola, I'd see at trade shows and other large companies say, kid, what are you doing? I mean, this makes no sense. Who cares about that? And I'd say, well, I care about it. And I could use all of our little cans and our little packaging and our little bottles to tell a story about carbon offsets and the good we're doing in the world. So I actually used, and I say it sincerely, I used the beverage business because of our overconsumption to have millions of products across the world with a story on them. I used those products to tell my story. And that story is now out in the world 10 years later across five or six brands that I founded and created on the shelves today. And we continue to tell our story of doing good in the world, of giving back, of, of, just, of just being a conscious citizen. And so we see oftentimes now that our consumers, they start making changes in their households because they like our brand. They love our brand. They like what we're doing. We start to see other young brands coming up that ask us, how do we do it? Can they learn how to become you know, a, a, you know, a native energy um, type uh, business model or, or organic or fair trade? So just very exciting to be here around all you people, you know, this is an amazing room of, you know, sentient beings that are really based on the energy that's part of our whole universe and just the fact that we could sit here together as balls of energy and talk about the good that we could do in the world through using, you know, renewable energy and, and some of the technologies like free energy that are out there that I've studied in my life. This is an amazing time. We should all be so proud of ourselves. So namaste and thank you for having us. <laughs> So we are over here, but um, I, I want to close with a couple things. One is I think for Americans, it's, it's just say no, number one. And number two, I want to give you a little fact here. Um, the, uh, you can't see this, and I couldn't get it on a slide, but it's how many Earths are needed to provide the level of consumption where we are today. For the USA, it's five and a half Earths. 
For the UK, it's three and a quarter. For France, it's three. For Germany, it's two and a half. For Russia, it's two and a half. For Brazil, it's two. For China, it's almost one. But that's going to change. So obviously, none of this is sustainable. And it's only going to come from us by saying no. And we can also boycott. That's the radical uh, uh, position, is boycott. We did that against uh, um, tuna that was catching dolphins, net, net dolphin tuna. And it, guess what? They changed a lot of their practices because women just said, I'm not buying it. I don't want to be responsible for killing dolphins, period. So the deeper we go into the issues, the more educated we are. Women, vote, vote with your dollars. Thank you very much.